So my name is Nicola Aitken. Um, I am a policy manager at Full Fact. Full Fact is the UK's independent fact-checking charity. We're a team of independent fact-checkers, researchers and policy specialists who find, expose and counter the harm that bad information does. Um, and I'll hand over to Professor Phil Howard, who is joining us this evening. Phil, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, Nicola, for joining for hosting us tonight. Um, so, yes, I'm Phil Howard. I'm director of the Oxford Internet Institute and um, I'll talk a little bit about our uh, latest misinformation work and uh, the book, Lie Machines. Um, the book was written, I guess, over the last two years, and the project as a whole started when I was based in Budapest, and uh, in the summer of 2014, when Malaysian Airlines flight was shot down over Ukraine, I watched my Hungarian friends get several kinds of, of misinformation about who had shot the plane down and why. There was the story of um, democracy advocates who had shot the plane down. Um, maybe they thought Putin was flying to Malaysia on commercial airlines. Um, there was the story of American soldiers, US soldiers who had shot the plane down. And then my favorite story was the story of a lost tank from World War II that had come out of the great forests of Ukraine confused and accidentally shot the plane down. And it's at that point that I, I realized that there were actually several nuances to the strategy of at least Russian origin misinformation. Uh, it wasn't a strategy that involved seeding one story that people could respond to or contradict. Uh, it was a strategy of seeding multiple conflicting, sometimes equally ridiculous stories that, that nobody could respond to in a consistent way. Opposition couldn't pick the narrative to, to address. And so, what surprised me over the years, and I tell some of these stories in the book, is, is seeing how this strategy of misinformation has gone from being something that um, leaders in authoritarian countries use on their own people to being something that dictators use against voters in democracies um, to being a strategy that political leaders in democracies use against their own voters during elections. Um, and that slide, that that slide, that transition is what uh, the book, Lie Machines, is all about. Now, um, the book is broken into several different chapters, several different kinds of case studies. Um, I think the important place to start is probably with a definition, right? The definition of what I, what I think a lie machine is. A lie machine for me is a system of technical infrastructure and a social organization that puts some untruth uh, into the service of a party or a political ideology. Now, let's unpack that. I think uh, one important part is the social organization, um, an ultra conservative or white supremacist group that wants to come up with a, a bit of misinformation about the impact of immigrants um, on the economy. And then the technical system is the social media platform that serves up junk news, fake news, um, to the people who will be receptive to it, um, or the people who um, who might be receptive to it. So the lie machine actually has those two parts. It's got the social organization and the technical system, the, the algorithms for distributing content. Now, over time, I think we've seen that there's actually several different functions here. There's a, there's a production function where you have teams of trolls uh, in Russia, in uh, many countries now, that, that come up with a story come up with a bit of misinformation. Um, there's the distribution system that involves uh, social media algorithms uh, and uh, your social media inbox, right? Uh, that puts content into your feed. And then there's the marketing system that is often a secondary news organizations that give stories additional spin or let stories build on each other. And I think we've seen that at work, unfortunately, around COVID, right? Um, one of the greatest misinformation packages I've seen involves uh, RFID chips and Bill Gates and the origins of COVID in um, a lab in Colorado, or maybe it was Northern Italy. Uh, there's a complex story, a nuanced story of conspiracy. It uh, builds on the anti-vax movement, right? So a long-standing uh, long movement of misinformation around the value of inoculations. It, it also builds on 
our lack of trust in what the government might be doing around COVID, right? Uh, so there's there's multiple things that a complex lie machine can build on, and and the misinformation around COVID is particularly pernicious, right? And so one of the storylines involves a conspiracy from Bill Gates to inoculate us against COVID um, through putting uh, in a process that puts RFID chips in our arms. A big overarching story that's um, in some ways it's easy to refute with evidence uh, in other ways it's such a large package it's hard to know what part of of that kind of storyline to start with so the problem for us as researchers is is figuring out where this stuff comes from and as a researcher often it's best to be multi-method so we have uh, some people who do field work with the labs, the trolls who, who produce this content. We do some big data analysis to figure out um, the trends, how somebody actually games Google search or games YouTube search. Uh, there's a real craft to, to both figuring out how to make use of social media algorithms and then figuring out how political actors have abused them. And right now we're sort of in a sensitive moment where we know a lot of the traffic around misinformation is on platforms that we can't study. Instagram, um, Tinder. I have a Tinder story I could tell later if you like, but there's a series of TikTok, YouTube, WhatsApp. There's a range of platforms that are actually pretty tough to study in a comprehensive way. Um, and that's where a lot of the action is now in terms of misinformation trends. I'm only going to talk for um, another 10 minutes or so, and then Nicola and I can have a conversation about what, what, uh, what she's observing, what we're observing together. Um, I thought I'd offer a quick run through some of the evidence that we prepared for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence uh, when it was looking back at what happened in 2016 in the U.S. Uh, up through 2017 and 2018. As you may recall, uh, the Senate asked major heads of heads of major technology firms to come and testify, and each of the firms turned over some fairly large data sets of accounts that they knew were managed from St. Petersburg. And these data sets are special because they're, they're among the few uh, fully attributed. The accounts were clearly set up and managed from IP addresses in St. Petersburg and the firms of a firm, firm this. Facebook in particular gave over some three and a half thousand uh, fake US citizens, US pro based profiles that had been managed for a long time. Look, look at the data. We found that some of the profiles had been active in, in other social media uh, as early as 2012. So of the surprises, um, the Russian accounts were active much, much earlier than we expected them to be active. When we look at the, the rhythm of their activity during the electoral year, uh, it's pretty clear that their, their bursts of activity are timed with natural spots in the electoral calendar. So uh, the big national conventions, the debates between Clinton and Trump, each of these are bursts of Russian activity. Election night, burst of Russian activity. Uh, so they started much earlier than we expected. Their activity parallels, uh, parallels events in politics. One of the other surprises for us is that the bulk of the activity we studied happened after 2016. So when Facebook turned over data, they turned over data from uh, about 2015 until middle middle of 2018. The peak of Russian activity was not on election night in 2016. It was much later, it was early into 2017. That's when the bulk of Russian activity occurs. And to me, this suggests that it's almost as if um, the Russian government's Russian government decided that they were successful or having some success or having some impact and put more money, put more staff into um, managing these accounts. So they started much earlier than they expected. Their activity parallels the natural rhythm of the electoral calendar, um, and the bulk of their activity has been since 2016. Now, another interesting finding is that the bulk of their activity moved from Facebook onto Instagram. Instagram is a fairly closed Closed, prof, um, closed platform, uh, independent researchers, uh, we independent researchers don't have systematic access to um, what's, what's found there. And that's a real challenge for research. It's a, it makes it difficult for me to say what kinds of misinformation trends are there. 
Uh, but we do know that the misinformation, the Russian activity, uh, really burst on Instagram after 2017 and into 2018. Facebook ads, ad purchases, were relatively minor parts of the campaign. And particularly, maybe you and I can talk about the role of ad ad buys. I think in this data that we were looking at for the U.S. election, political ads were were not as important as the organic content, right? the content coming from fake users who um, would tweet about soccer scores and so soap operas and um, you know, family photos from fake families, and then start talking about politics. Right? Those are the those are the bulk of the profiles that, that we found in this Russian data set. And then the themes that these accounts work on are all the polarizing themes that we know. In the US context, these are about um, Black Lives Matter, um, gun rights, uh, abortion. There's a, a series of hot button issues in the US, some of which also are hot button issues here around race um, and political speech. And the Russian strategy is to pick at these. Uh, the government strategy is to pick at these, to try to generate polarizing content. And the best of their, the most successful of their campaigns are the ones where they can get, get two different groups to meet on the street at the same time to protest, to have um, a physical, a violent interaction if possible. Uh, that's one of the outcomes. That's one of the goals of misinformation campaigns that, that we've tracked. Since having a close look at what happened in the US in 2016, um, our teams at Oxford have looked at how many other similar efforts there are around the world. In 2017, we counted 28 countries with organized misinformation campaigns. Uh, these are not lone wolf operations. These are organizations with uh, receptionists and hiring plans and performance bonuses. Uh, sometimes they have retirement plans, they have regular job ads, retirement plans, phones and desks. These are formal organizations. Um, in, 20, in 2017, we found 28 countries like that had these, these um, operations. In 2018, there were 48 countries, and last year there were 70 countries, these kinds of organized misinformation campaigns. Now, in authoritarian regimes, as you can imagine, these are often military units that have been retasked to doing this information. But in democracies, they're, they're regular PR firms, they're, they're political consulting firms that um, dabble and subcontract and, and create these kinds of um, astroturf movements, we sometimes call them, um, to, to put out misinformation. So it's, it's not just a problem, it's not just a challenge coming from authoritarian regimes. One of the big changes when we uh, we found last summer, when we did our inventory last summer, is that we found that there were several governments that were imitating the Russian government apparatus, the Internet Research Agency. Uh, Saudi, India, Pakistan, Venezuela, all now had small operations like what the Russians had. And in fact, in two countries, we found that the governments had sent staff to Moscow for training uh, on how to do good information operations. So there's a real learning curve uh, right between uh, between these types of regimes. And since COVID, a significant amount of that um, expertise has gone into COVID-related misinformation. Uh, let me say about a little bit about what that looks like because it's um, it's different all over again. Um, in an important way, China has really arrived as a producer of misinformation. For the last few years, they haven't really they haven't really produced a lot of content in English. When protests erupted in Hong Kong, and then they started to worry about what English language social media users were thinking about the protests. And they put out content about how the protesters were rioting uh, thugs and criminal gangs. Um, and, and that was the first moment, and they worked over multiple social media platforms that aren't actually accessible in China. So, so that that was a moment where it was clear that the Chinese government was interested in influencing opinion on Twitter and Facebook in, in English um, around what Having developed that skill, um, once uh, COVID sprung on the world and appeared to come from Wuhan, um, the Chinese government stepped up messaging around the origins of COVID, uh, and they put 
the CGTN, the major broadcaster, public broadcaster, into production as a sort of um, source, a, a, a means of producing new fake news stories about um, COVID. Now, what's challenging is that I think the very definition of misinformation has changed over time. And so now a lot of the Chinese language, the Chinese origin stories around COVID are actually about asking questions. Uh, so they don't, they don't argue that COVID actually originated in a lab in the United States, but they'll ask the question, did COVID, did COVID really originate, COVID-19 really originate in Wuhan, or did it come from uh, a lab in Colorado? Question mark. That's, that's the flavor. And it's not, um, just by asking the question, they allow, they allow to enter doubt. Um, they might have a quote from a, a doctor somewhere in the world who's, who also asks the question, um, but there's no evidence beyond that asking the question. And there's a range of themes the Chinese hit on. Um, the Russians also, Russian government also does misinformation around COVID. Both regimes have two or three common, common themes they hit. They like to talk about how democracies are failing, how uh, the political institutions here can't make good decisions, aren't being responsive, can't control the virus. They talk about the aid that China and Russia are offering to uh, Northern Italy, to uh, the White House. Right? Russia sent some masks to the White House, and, and this becomes a, a, a big story. And then there's the third story, consistent story, probably is about how China and Russia are leading the science. Phil, may yes. I interrupt very quickly? Hi. Your uh, microphone is rubbing against your shirt. May we ask you Got to? It. Thank you. Thank you, of course. And so, yes, the... Uh, the misinformation is about failing democratic institutions. It's about um, how China and Russia are leading the science. And it's about how um, uh, how those two governments are uh, providing aid to the rest of the world. Um, all stories which they're able to pull up, push out to a billion social media users a week. Um, I, we got that number by adding up the total reach of all Twitter accounts, YouTube accounts, Facebook accounts, Reddit accounts, and Instagram accounts that have signed up for content from Russia Today and uh, CGTN and a range of other national gov uh, government sources. So it's, it's quite a large audience. Once in a while, the reach, the social media reach for stories from those two governments will outstrip the reach of a story from the BBC Guardian or the New York Times. Most of the time that won't happen, but once in a while they, they can actually reach more people than a professionalized news outlet. The last thought I want to offer is sort of a long-term look um, at, at what I think is the, the existential threat to democracy. I think that um, it's probably safe or conservative to say that every national security issue, every budget bill, every tax bill will come with some kind of automated or control-based campaign for it or against it. it. It could be a complex humanitarian disaster. It could be a, an economic crisis. It almost doesn't matter what the issue is. Somebody will try and blame immigrants or try to blame uh, another country. And that, that mechanism for spreading information is, is misinformation is probably going to be a, a consistent part of national politics in most democracies. I think we've seen China arrive. I think China will be much more active on a range of other issues after COVID. I think we'll see many of these techniques applied to special interests, special interest lobbying of government uh, whenever some lobbyist needs legislative relief for some clients. These, these tools, these tricks will be in the toolkit right, for, um, uh, for, uh, for the political communication managers. And then I don't think we've seen artificial intelligence yet behind many of the, the campaigns, but I think we will. I think it is on the horizon. We've seen a few dramatic examples of how fake fake political images, uh, videos can be generated. But beyond that, I think if a, a lobbyist can work out what kind of face um, we'll reply to or we'll, we'll be most interested in, in hearing from, uh, there's behavioral research that suggests women respond well to men with a deep voice and, and men respond well to women with a high-pitched voice. Some of that behavioral research will start to feed the construction of 
faces and messages that will be customized directly for us. Um, and that that sort of feeding of behavioral data into messaging is is one of the things I, I think is on the horizon, not for the next election, but possibly the one after that. And then I think the really deep threat here is um, is to the role of science in public life. So many of these campaigns are about undermining our confidence in experts and evidence. Uh, a lot of them support politicians who go with their gut on key issues and and ask critical questions, but but not not in the sense of looking for evidence. They just um, uh, repeat or retort with whatever whatever lobbyists fed them information most recently. So that that role for science in public life, I think, is being diminished by misinformation campaigns, especially around health in public life. So I don't think it's too late, and the book does end upbeat, right? So there's a couple of things we can do. Um, making sure to cull the trolls that might be on our own accounts, um, reading things before we share them. Uh, government needs to invest, schools need to invest in, in media campaigns to help young people learn critical thinking skills, not forward everything they see. Um, and I think probably that we need a new economic model for journalism itself, right? Some of the revenue that's ending up the social media firms probably does need to be redirected to professional news outlets uh, so that they can do the investigative work, do the fact checking, uh, and produce truths that help us make decisions when we vote. There's certainly a lot of big, big public issues in front of us uh, to do with race and to do with health. And so I think it's, um, it's important that, that we clean up public life in this way. So, um, I have the, the, there's a code, Y-L-I-E-S, for purchasing the book if you want to use that. Uh, I hope you're still interested in this topic at the end of the conversation. But um, Nicola, I'm happy to, let's start chatting. What, what do you think, what's the most serious misinformation campaign you've looked at in the last few weeks? Thanks, Phil, for setting that out. It was really interesting to hear, um, it, particularly around the hostile states that you've seen who are manipulating the stories in this area because it feels from my perspective and feel fact we only look at the misinformation that's circulating in the UK um, but it feels like a lot of the narratives that we've heard around misinformation around COVID-19 in the UK has been focused on family and friends sharing organic content and um, sharing stories um, particularly on social media uh, so I think it's really interesting to hear that actually the hostile states are are active and, and taking advantage in this space Mm. Um, I mean, just to pick up on that a little bit, you mentioned you mentioned China's strategy of asking questions um, rather than sort of setting out the argument. And you know, I note that RT, the the Russian um, state broadcaster, their slogan is "Question More." So how do we how do we push back on this idea that actually is questioning a bad thing? Should mm. we be questioning less? Questioning less. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a. That is a great question. It's, it's, I'd say the, um, um, I would say that there are um, some institutions and organizations that we can trust and should trust a little more. We can't all individually be expert in everything. And, uh, you know, as in as much as a, a government has both experts and political appointees, um figuring out which experts to trust is part of the, the challenge of being a modern modern citizen now doing that work of figuring out who to trust probably involves having a diverse media diet right so if you're a liberal every once in a while you should check a conservative newspaper and if you're slightly conservative every once in a while you should see what the, the liberal papers are, are are writing about um understanding that uh, we can't all be expert in every single issue um, is uh, I mean I think that's a reasonable it's a reasonable limit to modern modern democracy and being passionate about a few things that we do research is is the way we can still contribute to public life. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so just to talk from a full fact perspective, when we see a claim that we want to fact check, we will always publish that on our website and always publish the source that we have made that decision from as well. So we're really keen that people make up their own minds um, using the data that we have used to, to come to their own conclusions. Um, I was really 
struck by what you were saying about um, about the kind of variety of conspiracy theories, basically, mm. that we've seen in the last few months. And it's something that we've certainly picked up on um, at Full Fact as well. So you mentioned Bill Gates. Um, and I think what's interesting about Bill Gates is that there's not just one story about Bill Gates. There's about 10 different stories about what Bill Gates is is apparently doing um, mm. and, and how he's trying to manipulate various things or make money or you know microchip all of us um, in some way. Um, I just find it really fascinating that there's such a variety of different things mm. out there and not just stories that are, are circulating in the UK or even Europe, it's becoming a real international um, yeah. information space. And that's certainly hope, um, certainly helped by the, the way that we are receiving information these days, the social media companies obviously are global. Um, I feel like we're certainly in a kind of a more precarious situation just through the prevalence of English language as well. Um, that certainly seems to be spreading a lot more uh, across other countries, but then equally, we are in a privileged position that there are many more people who want to rebut those stories and want to um, be able to, or are able to um, fact check them in some way or, or otherwise rebut them. Whereas in other right. countries who have minority languages, perhaps it's it's not happening it's as, much as effectively. Yeah. Yeah, we've I think we've noticed that too that there is um, there's very little fact checking in Arabic, for example. Um, if a country has a big civil society. And, and maybe has some donors who are willing to um, support a, some, it's sort of up to users to flag content. And then it's up to the social media platforms to, to evaluate the flag content and, and act responsibly. And I think the real challenge for you and I would both be frustrated by is that we have no sight of what, the, we have very little sight of what the fact, the fact, internal fact checking happens or what the internal flagging process is for so many of the firms. Absolutely. Um, I note, note that Twitter most recently have been fact checking uh, various posts, mm. most famously Donald mm. Trump, obviously. Um, but we have no insight into who's making those decisions in the companies and and what the process is for deciding which posts to fact check or, or whether, you know, what content to put next whether to it's it. Working. Nicola, I'm, I'm curious about your impressions. I have the impression that um, in response to COVID, Twitter has actually been pretty responsive. They're certainly sharing more data sets. And as you say, they're, they're um, flagging posts that are, um, that are misleading or um, promote uh, you know, maybe expressions of hate speech. Uh, I believe Facebook is doing a little bit more, but maybe not as thinking as creatively as Twitter. Um, but the also that both firms are doing more around COVID than they ever did around in the previous three years around um, other kinds of political issues, even though there was still misinformation. Is that, is that your, what's your thinking? How do you think the different firms have been responding in different ways? Yeah, I do think we have to give the different firms some credit um, for how they're responding to this very unique information crisis. As I mentioned before, it's not just around one country this time. So obviously the internet companies were, were thinking that the biggest information event of the year would be the US election. Actually, they've had to pivot and tackle these claims across basically every country in the world has, right. has had some version of this. So I do think we need to give them some credit. Um, we have seen, seen them take action. We've seen them make policy changes. Um, I mentioned Twitter, as you said, Facebook have done various things, as have Google. Um, I've been particularly impressed YouTube, yeah. by the, yeah. I've been particularly impressed by how much the companies are willing to promote um, accurate information mm. ahead of you know, other uh, sources. So particularly if you take Google search or YouTube when you're searching, um, even you know, Twitter and Facebook, when you look for specific terms in the search bar, it's, mm. it's accurate and kind of informative sources that come up um, first which is a step further than we've ever seen them go before. So I think that's really positive and we have to acknowledge that. that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. That being said, um, there's certainly a lot more that they could be doing. There's always more to do. So. Yeah, there's always more. Um, I think for me, the biggest one is that transparency space. So I mentioned Twitter not right. outlining how they're making their decisions. Um, actually, that's a problem that all of the internet companies have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think transparency would be the, the biggest thing, especially when we're talking about content around 
what people are trying to say online, particularly beliefs. You know, we talked about conspiracy theories before. Um, there's certainly nothing that says that you cannot believe a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, you know, we have really big questions around freedom of speech at the minute that we have to be conscious of. And I think that the best way to tackle that is around greater transparency. Agree, agree. Um, I remember, I think one of the last conversations we had was about the fake fact checking sites. Have, have you noticed any of these in your domain now? Uh, are they closed? Are there more of them open? Sorry, say that again. Yeah. Fake, fake fact-checking sites. So sites oh, that yes. pretend to be fact-checking sites, but are not actually doing the fact-checking work that you're doing. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, it's a slightly niche part of the problem, but it's mm -hmm. certainly a really important one. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, you mentioned before that people need to to know who to trust or know um, what experts they can they can trust to to give views on things that are way more complicated than than they want to look into or have time to look into. Mm -hmm. um, and having fake fact checkers certainly um, is a real threat to the real fact checkers out there who are trying to do good work and are trying to be transparent. So I think that's certainly a problem. Um, it's not something I've seen particularly around um, COVID-19 in a structured way. Um, but I think there are certainly lots of people out there who are trying to um, promote the truth of what's happening in the way that they see it mm -hmm. uh, and trying to do that in a in a you know very factual I use factual in a uh, inverted yeah. commas. In inverted commas, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, shall we take a few questions or absolutely. Okay. Um there's a great question from um a David Horgan actually um who's asking do Britain, the USA and other Western governments have similar programs as part of their soft power? I think that's picking up on um what you were saying around Russia and China. So I'd be really interested in your view on that. I think the answer I mean, the answer is yes, but they're different. So when we do our inventories, actually no, uh, so the answer is yes. When we do our inventories of government expenditures on misinformation, if, if a democracy, for example, has a, an information campaign that's trying to discourage uh, young women from becoming ISIS brides and moving to Syria, that we don't count that as a in our in our count of, of what governments are spending on on social media manipulation so that might be a, an example of a fake grassroots movement that does is is normatively valuable so we, we don't include those kinds of campaigns in a democracy if there's a pr firm that has clearly been caught running a misinformation campaign on a client or a lobbyist then we do we do count that. So the answer is yes. These things do exist in democracies. Um, if they're if they're tied to a national, a reasonable national security issue, where there are you know there's judicial oversight, then we don't we don't include those campaigns. Um, but if they're freelance lobbyists um, just playing with technology, then we we do count those in. There also aren't very many of those. There aren't as many examples of those um, in uh, from the militaries in. Western democracies, as there are from the other highly militarized governments. Thanks. Um, I'll just take another question then um, from Chris Dye, which I think is linked to that. So he's asked, are you investigating what kinds of audience are susceptible to different kinds of misinformation? Um, which I think so, is a really interesting question around the different types of, uh, of campaigns that various organizations or countries are running. It, it is. And that it's actually really tricky to study that, right? There's no there are no statistical models that will relate a tweet to a changed vote. We can't make that kind of direct causal connection. Um, what we do know is that there are there's a very long tail to misinformation. So you can still measure the number of uh, young voters in the U.S. who think that Hillary Clinton was up to something in that pizzeria, in um, you know outside Washington D.C. They don't quite know what, but they think there was something going on there. Um, you can still you can still measure the number of UK citizens who think that they'll be saving uh, hundreds of millions of pounds for the NHS by leaving um, uh, leaving the EU. So there's a there's a long tail to a story. Once it gets out and reinforced, it's it's difficult to disabuse people of it. We we think that um, older voters may be a little bit more likely to share misinformation. We don't know that they. Are more likely to believe it themselves. So, so it's it's not simply that older voters are more susceptible. 
um, to believing the stuff, they are more likely to share it. Um, we, we do think that, um, that people who spend, who have more of their main news diet coming from social media are exposed to more misinformation than people who have a diverse media diet, some TV, some print, uh, and some digital. So there's a few effects we know. Unfortunately, one of the other things we, effects we know is that it's fairly common across many countries we've studied to find examples of prominent uh, female politicians or women journalists or feminist intellectuals who are driven off social media because of some nasty, particularly nasty uh, campaign that's targeted them. So one of the certain effects is has been in pushing some women out of public life. And, and that's another, that's definitely, an, uh, that's, that's one of the definite effects. Yeah, it's really interesting you're saying about this um, prevailing view in the US that Hillary Clinton was up to something. Um, I wonder if that's actually one of the biggest kind of detrimental impacts of disinformation campaigns. So it's not that one particular story or claim is believed, it's this kind of deepening distrust in either a particular person or a particular institution or process. Um, and that's that's one of the really kind of things that we need to fight against. Um, but it's really hard to fight against because it's so um, intangible. Well, and as you say, it, it can be about process. So if, if there's misinformation about um, about uh, an election, the, the trust in elections or vote counting, right? If, if especially if major politicians say things things that undermine their own electoral system, right? that that becomes um, a vicious cycle where people trust they're not sure they should even bother to vote. They don't vote, or they make unusual choices. Um, that that creates the cycle of um, cycle of mistrust in political in in our own institutions. Absolutely. Um, that leads us quite nicely into another question, actually, from um, Mike Thomas around, do you think that the motivations and intentions of information operations have changed? Um, he's mentioned since the early 1900s, yes. um, or are we just more susceptible to misinformation given the amount of data that we are exposed to in modern life? I'm interested in your views on that. Fascinating. So I think several things have changed since, um, since the last century. Most misinformation campaigns century, most misinformation campaigns were very large. They were coordinated by states in times of war or major crises. They involved um, paying large amounts of money for uh, radio stations that would broadcast over large areas or dropping pamphlets from airplanes. I mean, there, there were propaganda campaigns, but they tend, used to be that only major governments could do them. And it usually involved sort of military units enacting and the resources of the state to enact them. So the first thing that's changed is now it's it's much cheaper, right, to do direct propaganda messaging over social media that'll target particular people on the basis of race or gender. So it's much, much more focused. It's much, much less expensive. And it's so much faster, right? It's direct and fast. I also think there's a qualitative change in, in how the propaganda is structured in that so much of it is now A-B tested, right? So that there'll be one message that's um, tested on a subpopulation, another on a sub, another population. And once once you get the click-through rates, um, you hone that, you pick message B, and then you hone it, variation B prime, and you know B and B prime, you make another variation. And that process of uh, A-B testing, rapid testing a message, refines the message so quickly and delivers it to a more and more accurate target. And so I think that's a, a significant qualitative difference from, from the intentions of info ops from, from years ago or years by. But uh, Nicola, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I also wonder if um, people are much more aware of, of these tactics now and um, or aware that it, it could be happening. And I think, um, you know, even in the UK, we had a particular rise in consciousness in 2017 around um, particularly the Salisbury poisoning where we see, saw a really coordinated campaign from the Russian state then um, but it, obviously this year as well there's been as I mentioned before there's been a lot of um, a lot of news and a lot of um, kind of education campaigns being running to say you know exactly the kind of things that you mentioned before take care before you share that was the UN campaign that ran mm -hmm. earlier uh, last week there's you know the BBC have done ones as well around checking your source 
thinking mm. before you share, all of those kind of things. So I do wonder I think, if people are much more aware of it now, and that also means that the tactics have to change. Absolutely. I think also journalists are getting better at reporting this kind of stuff, right? The, so there are more fact-checking organizations like yourself that, um, that, that help everybody by providing the resource. And then I think news organizations, it's now a pretty standard peg, right, for pretty much every election. Um, somebody will write about the information operations at play. You know, Nicola, thank you for listening to you talk about um, innovation on this. I um, I do want to point out that much of the innovation happens during a U.S. presidential election because that's when tens and hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on doing tricky things with new technologies. And so what happens in November in 2020 is going to have follow-on consequences for other democracies. Whatever tools and tricks get practiced over the next five or six months in the U.S. will, will come to other democracies. Um, and you know, the, the, I think there are there are things that the platforms will do. I hope to try to prevent the leak of those tactics. But um, the, the big cycles of innovation seem to be 2012, 2016, 2020. That's that's when innovation in this area happens. Yeah, I think that's completely completely true. Um, do you think, though, that there is a risk that we get too caught up in, particularly the U.S. election cycle? Yes, in terms because of tackling this problem. Yes, because and and you would know this from from your own your own um, uh, work history. Yes, because many of the things that um, political leaders do in the U.S. are simply illegal. In, in the UK or the EU, they, they just would not be, they could not be done, or they would, the, the punishments and fines involved would be would be serious and swift and immediate if caught. In the US, there tends to be um, a, a lot more, it's, it's a much less regulated environment. Elections officials don't have the resources to track everything very well. There's a lot of variety state to state. So, you know, in some states, elections administrators will catch things and others just don't have the resources to do it. So I, I think you're right. We shouldn't um, we shouldn't assume that whatever uh, nasty tricks get developed in the U.S. will will be applied uh, elsewhere. But um, but uh, you know we should, it would be nice to to be ahead of the game and make sure that they don't come here. Absolutely, ahead of the game is definitely the goal here. Um, although I wonder if that's ever possible, um, given the amount of resources that various actors put into, as you say, A-B testing a lot of this or, or finding the best techniques? Well, there's one there's one interesting way, we were talking about YouTube earlier, um, there's one interesting way we are ahead of the game and that is with uh, fake videos. So it turns out that it's fairly hard to produce, at the moment, hard to produce a good fake video. And um, when you try to compress a fake video to upload it to YouTube, YouTube can detect something about the fakeness in the way the compression works. So for the moment, there's a, there is that, they're ahead of the game technically. Um, it's, in fact, I don't, I'm not sure there's ever been a, a successful, I can't think of a successful misinformation fake video campaign uploaded to YouTube. Does that any, does that any pop into mind for you? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I, what I do think is interesting is that people are so worried about fake videos. Um, and actually there's almost the, the other problem of, um, you know, somebody gets caught on video doing something, um, you know, bad or, or less than ideal. Um, and then there's the, the possibility that they could claim that that was a fake video in itself. So you've also got that yes. that risk um, yes. now that these technologies are, are becoming more and more um, available as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about yes. the role of the media, um, and particularly so some person, um, sorry, John Rosenfield has asked, is there a problem of misinformation in media due to the problem of editorial process? I think that, yeah, a couple of people have picked up from the point that there's a demise of local media, that local media is, um, you know, they're all competing for our attention and so potentially increasing their stories um, to be a bit more sensationalist or have more dramatic headlines. Um, how much of a problem do you think that is and how much is that contributing to, to the misinformation, disinformation space? I think it's a, a medium-sized problem. So it's, it, it, I think the instinct is right that um, more and more outlets need to generate sensational titles, um, headlines, and um, that 
editorial, you know, editorial decisions do shape the quality of uh, reporting. Um, I would say that the, I would say that this, there's some evidence that people, uh, us on our own, social media users on our own, do tend to uh, have good information behaviors on the whole. So when, when we see a mistake on Wikipedia, we tend to edit it and correct it. It's called positive herding. We, we do things as a group that are, tend to be helpful. And when we see an obvious piece of junk news, we tend not to forward it. Um, certain people do all the time, but um, most people most of the time don't share misinformation. Uh, most of the junk news, most of the junk news out there isn't for the average social media user. It's, it's not consumed by the average voter. It's actually a, a fairly particular niche that, that is the audience for that stuff. And it doesn't come from mainstream, out, mainstream outlets. Um, for example, we did a study once of um, misinformation on national security issues targeted at military personnel who were on duty overseas. So this is, this is about information about Syria, what was going on in India, Pakistan, targeted at, at um, NATO military personnel who were doing their service. And one of the things we found is that people doing military service are among the most sophisticated news consumers we'd ever seen. They, they, don't, they don't share any of that junk. Um, they know where it comes from and they, they don't forward it. The challenge is their friends and family. So the, the people who are immediately out them who are not doing the military service, but who are um, interested in military conspiracies, and, and they're the ones more likely to spread misinformation on national security issues. So it's, editorial process is definitely an important part of it, um, but, uh, but I think I, if more people got their news from professionalized news outlets, I think they, they'd have a higher, higher quality information diet. Yeah, I, I agree with you that it's a medium problem. Um, obviously, at, at Full Fact, actually, we spend a lot of our time fact-checking newspapers, um, particularly where they have you know, misrepresented statistics or polls. Polls are the worst, actually. Um, a lot of people get uh, misinterpreted polls. Um, so we do quite a lot of fact-checking of the newspapers. And I think what's been interesting in COVID-19, actually, is that they, I mean, I'm, I'm very much generalizing here, but a, a lot of the newspapers in the UK um, were publishing some of the conspiracy theories, um, particularly around 5G, for example, um, at the start of the year. But we've really seen that stop now. Um, and I think the newspapers are being a lot more careful about particularly things like um, conspiracy theories or, or cures. Um, that's another theme that we've seen around COVID-19. Um, may may so, I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, of course. So since, um, since starting at Full Fact and since having such a big impact through Full Fact, have you noticed that media outlets are are doing less fact checking on their own. So most most professional outlets are supposed to have fact checkers, right? And you know there's different processes, but most of them are supposed to do their own fact checking. Uh, have you noticed that journalism is withdrawing a little bit on their own fact checking staff resources because full fact is there to call them out and do that proofing? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, the answer is I don't I don't know specifically if if newspapers are or media outlets um, are particularly withdrawing from fact checking. Obviously, um, it's a really difficult time in the media landscape at the minute, and various organisations are are cutting their staff. Um, I think there's probably a mixture, or there's probably an amalgamation of fact checkers and investigative journalists. Um, and I think certainly investigative journalism is is one of the key aspects of the media that needs to be protected um, because they do such a valuable job beyond the, beyond the just reporting of the single story, actually diving underneath and, and explaining how we got here and, and what's happening and making sense of some really complicated issues. And I think if that gets lost, um, then that does only help this problem of, of only reading the headline or only getting the surface understanding of the story. Um, so I think that's certainly an issue. Um, I think what we have seen, though, in the last couple of years in particular, but especially over COVID-19, is more organisations setting up um, setting up teams who will look at claims that are circulating on social media um, in particular. So, you know, we saw this um, last year 
with the um, elections that happened in the UK, we're seeing it now in COVID-19, people like BBC. BBC have got an excellent team um, looking at social media um, claims that are being circulated there, but also Channel 4. Uh, so I think that's that's increased, certainly, in the last couple of years. But I think it's been a really positive nice. increase as well. Nice. Um, we're getting towards the end of this so why don't we finish on a bit of a positive note um how what's your top tip on on how we solve this problem solve the problem so um i think that the top tip for individual individually is uh to be more careful about forwarding right to uh, to go through our own follower lists and get rid of the people who are we really don't know um and uh, be careful forwarding content that's that's the individual tip I do think that there's a structural thing we could do, and this is, um, in some ways, this is pie in the sky thinking. But I think, I think data is how we express ourselves now. The, the the stuff we buy on our credit card, our physical location in space, what we do with our mobile phone, all that stuff generates all that all those devices uses of devices generate politically meaningful data, and right now, most of that politically meaningful data goes to Silicon Valley. So my top tip solution is something I've actually borrowed from the Blood Diamonds campaign. And one of the innovations of the Blood Diamonds campaign was that was this argument that if you could if you could tell a consumer where a diamond came from, most consumers would not buy the diamonds that came from the nastiest pits of um, pits of Africa. Right? They would buy clean diamonds. And I think we should be able to look at any device that we have and ask it to tell us who. The ultimate beneficiary is of the data that comes that's collected on our device, right? So, with the diamonds, you could say who is the ultimate beneficiary of purchasing a diamond? Who's the ultimate beneficiary of the, the location data coming from my phone, or the consumption data coming from my refrigerator? Now, at the moment, devices can't even do that. The answer is that it's mostly Sil Silicon Valley firms and their third-party third-party organizations. But if we could get a device to tell us who's benefiting from our data, then maybe we could add organizations to that list of beneficiaries. And I, as a citizen, if I want to add my faith-based group, uh, some COVID health researchers, uh, and a couple of academics to my flow of data, um, I probably would. I think many of us would contribute volunteer to put, da put data in the hands of health researchers if we could. Right now, we don't even have that infrastructural choice. So I think that the first thing we really need to do is is break this monopoly of flow of data to, to Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's really interesting. I love that uh, comparison to the, the blood diamonds um, and everybody being more conscious. I think there's a, lot, there's a lot going on just now about conscious choices, particularly when we think about the, the environment and if we could apply that same mentality to our, uh, our choices of how we spend our time online or, or use our devices. I think that's a really interesting concept. Um, I guess I would build on that and say that we need we need collaboration across a variety of different sectors to push for this change. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really fascinating what we've seen the last couple of weeks with all, um, a variety of advertisers pulling their advert uh, spend from a variety of different platforms. Um, I'm not sure that's the, the long-term solution, um, but it's certainly an interesting lever that's been pulled um, and mm -hmm. it's been good to see the, the platforms respond in some way and, and make some changes, particularly Facebook. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think collaboration and collective action is needed to tackle these problems. Yep. Um, just for our last minute, we've had one request which I very much back. Could you please tell us a Tinder story? The Tinder story. Um, so one of our store, one of our researchers um, a few years ago for the 2019 UK election found a Tinder bot that would flirt and then talk about Jeremy Corbyn. And the only way we, the only reason we know about it is that the campaign managers who built the bot on Tinder went on to Twitter and thanked the bot for giving them a few percentage points edge in a couple of key districts. So, so they actually went on Twitter and said thank you to the Tinder bot and named the districts where they thought it had given them an edge. Now, I, I don't know whether the, twi the Tinder bot actually did get particular um, MPs elected, but, but the campaign managers who testified to it on Twitter seemed convinced that it was worthwhile. 
So, and whether or not you believe it, and the, the important point is simply that whatever platform emerges, uh, we'll have people talking politics on it a little bit, and we'll have other people trying to manipulate politics on it. That's certainly a great example of innovation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. In it's places, good. surprising places, yes. Absolutely. Um, and we haven't even touched on, on some of these new platforms that are emerging and their role to play in, in the, the information environment to come. Yes. Um, but we'll pause there. We have run out of time, although I'm sure we could talk about these issues for longer. Um, apologies to those questions that we didn't get the chance to answer. Um, please do have a look at Phil's great book. Um, you can buy the book. There should be a link just at the bottom of your screen, which says buy Phil Howard's latest book. Um, go ahead and click that. And Phil, do you want to repeat the, the code as well? Yes, it's capital Y L I E S. Great. And it, it works on the, on the uh, Yale University Press. Thanks. Great. So thank you very much to the Oxford Martin School for arranging this event. Thank you to everybody for joining this evening. Um, I hope you have a enjoy the rest of your evenings and uh, yeah, think before you share. Think before Read you share. Read beyond nice. the headline. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Nicola.